And so the next talk is by Max Gunther from Astrophysics, uh, and he's going to talk about hunting exoplanets and unmasking false positives and more time domain astronomy with the New Generation Telescope. So uh, Max, all yours, and 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much for having me today. Um, as I said, my name is Maximilian Günther. I'm working in the astrophysics group with Didier Kelo in the field of exoplanets. Today I'm going to talk about NGTS, the Next Generation Transit Survey, and what we do with it, which is hunting for exoplanets, uh, also unmasking some false positives, which is crucial in these exoplanet surveys, we're going to talk about in a few minutes, and some other time domain astrophysics. NGTS, the Next Generation Transit Survey, we can see here, it's 12 telescopes, quite small telescopes, 20 centimeter uh, diameter, based at ESO's Paranal Observatory in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, the driest desert in the world. There's also the location of the very large telescopes, the VLT, um, which are currently the world's greatest telescopes. Our goal is to find small planets around bright stars that are bright enough to follow them up with a lot of other instruments and really find out their radii, their masses, find out about their atmospheres, find out about their habitability. Uh, in, overall, in four years, we cover 10% of the entire sovereign sky, so it's a really wide field survey. We observe thousands of stars at once uh, in one CCD image. And a really remarkable thing about NGTS is that we have a high pre uh, precision, about a factor 10 better than any um, preceding instrument from the ground had these tasks. So how do we look for exoplanets with our instrument? I'm sure most people are familiar already with the transit method. If an exoplanet passes in front of the host star, it blends out a fraction of its light. Here on the y-axis we see um, the light coming from the star. Here would be around 100% and it drops down to say something like 99% in the case of a, a big planet. And as the planet goes out of the line of sight again, um, we reached 100% level again. So to put NGTS precision into perspective, here's a comparison of the NGTS data taken for a single transit event of a known exoplanet compared with the SuperWASP project, which was uh, before NGTS basically the state of the art and found hundreds of exoplanets. We see quite clearly there's a drastic improvement in precision that really allows us then to push to very small planets that have a very shallow transit, something like just two times or four times the size of our Earth. And with this, sorry, with this method, we recently announced our very first exoplanet, NGTS 1b, which made the news. Uh, here's an image from the independent um, newspaper. Uh, a couple of other national and international news covered this. They called it a monster planet around a dwarf star. Well, obviously this is an artist illustration, that's not really the picture we took, um, so don't get confused. But why is it a dwarf star? Uh, the target star is a so-called M star. It's a very small star. It's about half the size of our sun and emits more in the red spectrum. And it's a monster planet because this thing here is at least the size of Jupiter, potentially twice the size of Jupiter, so something that we don't even have in our own solar system. And such a massive star around such a, uh, such a massive planet, around such a small star, in an orbit of only 2.6 days. So this thing is really hot. It's really a, a drastic uh, event that we have here. And something that was not predicted by theory, because the formation of planetary systems actually says, around these really small dwarf stars, we can't have such a huge planet. So that's where theorists have to step in now and um, develop some new theories about that. How does the data for NGTS 1b look like? Here we see the light curve, this transit event, um, the real data of NGTS. And here we see it's a quite a faint star because it's such a small one and, and not very bright. Um, we see there's a lot of noise, but we clearly see the transit event. Uh, we did some follow-up photometry with a bigger telescope around a 1.2 meter class telescope, the OLECAM, which we see here. And from this, we can calculate the radius of our planet simply as a, a relation between the radius of the star to the transit depth here. We can also perform some spectroscopic follow-up. I won't go into much detail on that, but the HARP spectrograph, currently the state of the art for that, um, can give us the radial velocity signal. 
So the pull of the planet on the star and the wobble of the star. And from this, we can calculate the mass. So we know roughly this is about the mass of Jupiter and at least one to two times the size of Jupiter. So what do we expect to find in the upcoming four years with NGTS? I did some yield estimations for that, and after four years, we expect to find actually a nice handful of super-Earths. Those are not really amazing Earths, but they're just a little bit bigger than Earth. We also find a couple of dozen, or we will find a couple of dozen of small and large Neptunes, up to a hundred of those. This is about four times to eight times the size of our Earth. And then we'll find hundreds of Saturns and Jupiters, so everything nine times the size of the Earth up to 20 times the size of our Earth. This is where NGT S1b falls in. But what we also see in this graph, we have some very large bars here. This is a logarithmic scale. So we will find thousands and thousands of these EBs and BEBs, eclipsing binaries and background eclipsing binaries. And those are these false positives that I called out in my title. So let's look at those in a bit more detail because we really need to distinguish what is a planet and what is something else. Planetary transit signals can be caused by planets. They can also be caused by brown dwarf or low mass stars. These are stars, but they're roughly the size of a giant planet. So we have star stellar-like objects or stars that are about the same size of Jupiter or a bit bigger. And they really look the same. We really need to follow them up and look at their mass to distinguish what it is. Is it a planet or is it a star? We could also have two stars orbiting each other in the same, pardon, in the same way as uh, up here, but these two stars actually to be of the same size, more or less, but having a grazing eclipse, so only a fraction of the light gets blended out, again leading to a planetary-like transit event. And finally, what I'd like to uh, focus on in the next few slides are these blended stellar binaries, BEBs, background eclipsing binaries. That means we look at the target star, and the target star is really boring. It's a single star, there's nothing happening. But somewhere along our line of sight, far in the background, there's actually two stars, just like these or these, and these eclipse each other. There's no planet involved. But the light from this object may fall within the same CCD pixel as the light from the bright target star. This is a real image of a star on our CCD pixel. All the light we capture from all these stars falls into one pixel on our CCD. And we really just measure how much light we gain at uh, intervals of about 12 seconds every time we take an image and create the light curve from that. So we need to be really cautious um, that this is not really what's happening in our pixel, but that this is really a planet going around the star. How can we do this? Well, the prime method for that is the so-called centroiding method, which I've implemented and, and designed for the NGTS survey. We can measure the center of flux in each of our CCD images in the star. In this case, say, the center of flux would lie here if we're out of transit. That means at this point in time. This is a time series of the flux over time and the centroid, center of flux over time. We see as we progress, we might come to this point where the transit is happening and the center of flux shifts a little bit. And this shift needs at least a 1 over 20th to 1 over 100th pixel precision. So we need to be really, really fine. Again, all our light falls into one pixel and we need to determine where in this pixel the light falls to a precision of 1 over 100th pixel. Luckily, we do achieve this and we actually overcome what we hope to achieve. We achieve a precision down to 0.25 millipixels less than a thousandth of a pixel. That's what we can see here in this diagram. On the x-axis, we see the centroid in x, the scatter, the RMSME, and on the y-axis, we see the centroid in y, RMSE. We see down to 0.25 millipixel in the best case, around 0.7 millipixel in average, and even the worst cases are around a one over a thousandth pixel precision on this centroid time series. So it's a lot of um, practicality, but how does it look in real data life. On the y-axis, we see the flux. On the x-axis, we see the face. This is a typical transit light curve, just like the model I showed you in the beginning. And this is real data we took with NGTS last year. We see on various sky images from different telescopes, it looks like a perfect single star. So it might well be a single star. But if we perform the centroiding analysis, and we plot the centroiding in x, central flux movement in x, central flux movement 
in y direction, we see there's a clear shift here as well. So something is happening in this pixel. This is not an isolated star with a planet. There must be a diluted background object. And I like to point out that this is on the level of less than five millipixels. And this is on a level of less than two millipixels. And we can see this shift by eye. That's the precision we achieve here. So I put this all together into a Bayesian modeling framework and run an MCMC analysis, putting all the mathematical constraints and um, transit models in there. And I can actually retrieve from our data what the real delusion of the system is. So how bright is our uh, target that we actually look at, which is a constant star, and how bright or faint is this background eclipsing binary? I can calculate exactly what the location of this blending system is. So where does it lie in uh, arc second separation? So this is less than one arc second for those familiar with the astronomical uh, units. And finally, we can calculate how deep is the real uh, eclipse. So it looked like something like a 3% eclipse in here, but actually it is about 25%. So these are really two stars eclipsing each other, not a planet going around a star. Finally, NGTS can do much more than just um, exoplanets. NGTS covers, as I said, 10% of the sovereign sky with a high precision. We can study, for example, these low mass binaries in more detail, which are very similar to exoplanets, but can give us a lot of insight into the stellar physics happening. Here with the NGTS data, we can um, calculate the radii. In this case, we have two dwarf stars in a 1.75 day orbit orbiting each other. They have very similar radii. We see two eclipse events of almost the same as when star one goes in front of star two and vice versa. We can again use, for example, HARPS, the spectrograph, um, for these radial velocity measurements, which give us the mass. We see, oh, they're real, uh, really near equal mass. That's a really interesting um, prospects for stellar astrophysicists because we can calculate the radii, we can calculate the mass, we can calculate more about their physics. We can also study a lot of variable stars. We, will, we cover hundreds of thousands of stars uh, over our four-year lifetime. Obviously, we don't want to go through all these by eye. Um, it would take a lifetime of work. Instead, we employ machine learning tools to identify and classify some of these objects. And finally, we can look at stellar flares, which are explosive magnetic outbursts of the star. We can detect and model, for example, G star super flares. If anybody is familiar with the Carrington event in 1859 um, that caused a big uh, outage of our electricity system and telegraph lines back then, these kind of events, if they would happen nowadays on our sun, and they're predicted to happen in a couple of thousand to million years, it could blow out our entire uh, civilization as we know it nowadays. So studying other stars for these events is really crucial to understand our own solar system and uh, potentially cause some uh, uh, preventions. And with this, uh, I leave up my summary slide and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Max, and again, thanks for keeping to time. We've got time for several questions there. Um, yeah. Why is the data coming out of uh, this survey much better than the WASP data? Good question. So the big uh, difference, A, is the camera development. So we put a lot of effort into developing together with Ander, which is our CCD uh, provider, um, really good CCD chips. Um, that are yeah, way better than the WASP CCDs. And the second is WASP had a different observing strategy. WASP jumped between different fields multiple times um, per night, while we try to follow one field over the entire night. That means we bring down what we call the red noise, so the systematics we don't really understand, um, because we, we stay way better in our pixels. And a lot of the, this red noise well, comes from the atmosphere, but also comes from not quite understanding the CCD and chittering uh, within the pixels. So if I, I showed the picture of um, one star on the NGTS uh, image before, um, in WASP this would like lie on a different pixel all the time. In NGTS we stay on the same pixel over the entire night. So that's this auto-guiding that we use for that is uh, quite a remarkable enhancement as well. Thank you. Max, presumably for the um the good transit events, the one you're looking for, then you still get centroid shifts 
when the transit happens, how easy is it to discriminate between different types of centroid shifts and therefore the true population of good eclipses and bad ones? Yeah, very good question. Um, so for if, if there was an isolated star with a planet going around, we wouldn't measure a centroid shift because it would be way below our precision or sensitivity. Um, if there, however, is a constant background star somewhere in the background, then we would measure indeed a centroid shift. But we could, or I, I can, with my code, um, disentangle just from the direction of where it shifts, which of these objects is the one that's eclipsing. And I can uh, simulate and get the likelihood via these MCMC simulations um, what the dilution factor would be. So for this event, for example, it would way more favor a solution that has a very low dilution because we have something very faint in the background that just dilutes a little bit, um, but the transit is actually a planetary transit. But in that sense, the centroiding method is also important to employ for every candidate um, because it gives us this information what the real undiluted depth is, um, not being uh, yeah, uh, I don't, uh, influenced by any background object. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any more? Uh, yes. <laughs> With your high precision, can you also study the atmosphere of the planets? Is it already sufficient? Yeah. For the atmosphere studies, we need to use a little bit of different technique. Um, it's kind of similar. Um, for example, the transmission spectroscopy that we use also use, makes use of the transit technique. Uh, but NGTS is made to scan as much of the sky as possible, having hundreds of thousands of stars or thousands of stars at once in its field of view, hundreds of thousands of stars over three or four years. And through that, we're limited in, in the precision we can get, and we only use one band pass. What we do to study atmospheres is, as I said, transmission spectroscopy. So we look at one star in a lot of detail with a very big instrument. For example, um, the JWST mission is going to launch um, soon, and that mission will allow to cover multiple band passes so we can look uh, at small spectral ranges and we can really figure out what the light is that comes through at each of these spectral ranges, so how much light gets blended out. And that gives us an information about what kind of molecules must be in the atmosphere of the planet. Imagine having a rocky planet with a puffy atmosphere around it. Then these molecules, say we have uh, water, uh, methane or something like this in there, um, they will uh, transmit, uh, let light transmit, or let uh, absorb light at different wavelengths. And that's only what we get with these really high precision measurements. So that's not what NGTS is, is made for. Okay. I think we're out of time. I've actually got a couple of questions myself, which I will chase up afterwards. <laughs> but, but thanks very much, Max. Thanks Thank again. You.